Good morning. We're live, I believe. Good morning, good afternoon around the world to everyone who is here today for this plenary session at the Harassus meeting. My name is Ros Matheson uh, in London. I oversee international political coverage for Bloomberg News and I'm pleased to be your moderator today. I'm joined by four very interesting panellists, all of whom will have something unique to share with you. Um, our topic today is very timely and also very complex. We're talking about how management foresight can ensure regional trade accords don't just facilitate trade but also improve sustainability. And the tricky question of how you can foster green growth in a way that also supports companies and economies and jobs and helps the environment all at once. And is that even possible? What comes first? Uh, what is the role of the state in this for companies? And where do we land on issues like subsidies? The recent COP26 summit in Glasgow and the conversations that went on there between countries, between countries, and also between countries and companies shows that, that we just can't tackle green issues down the track, that taking decisions and actions now is necessary when we think about where we want to be not just in five years or 10 years, but even in 50 years, because economies will fundamentally change alongside the environment. Consumption will change, work will change. And these can seem like overwhelming questions as a result, but the start is simply to be talking about it more and to sharing these ideas. So I'm very pleased today to, vet, to welcome our panelists, each of whom will give some brief opening remarks, after which we'll open to questions and discussion. And if you have any comments or questions, please do put those in the chat button so that I can see them to put to our, to our panelists. Uh, I'd like first to, to call on, of course, Ranel Wickremesingo, who is a former Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, to kick us off with his opening remarks. Thank you. Well, uh, I think uh, Glasgow was very, very interesting, but also disappointing. We, we did not get the full results that was expected. Before we were, while, while we think of the opportunity that will come to us, of the changes that will take place, the new economy that will come into place, we still got hurdles to jump. Because there is no guarantee that we are going to be 1.5 degrees centigrade. We haven't. As, as it goes now, it will be over uh, 2 centigrade or more. So where do we bring it down? So that there has to be deep cuts. Uh, secondly is the whole issue of uh, China, India, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and when they phase out coal. Look at it, if they, have, they have to develop. The Asian engine, growth engine, will run on China and India. And there's Indonesia, the other scope, Vietnam, which is developing, Bangladesh. So well, how do you handle it? It's not really a question of coming out of coal. It's a question of uh, if there is no growth in those countries, there is no growth here. So we, we've got to sit down and talk this over. If you have to accelerate the process, accelerate the process everywhere, not, not only uh, in these few countries. So that's that's one hurdle. And secondly, the money, the one trillion dollars has not yet turned up. You need more than a trillion. So where, where, where do you get the funds? Thirdly, we have another issue because the financial space available to many countries in the region has really narrowed down due to COVID and the debts that have been incurred there. So those are the those those basic issues have to be handled before before we can really think of the uh, new economy that will come into place. Certainly on the Asian side, we've got the uh, regional comprehensive economic partnership coming on that side. You've got the comprehensive and progressive uh, trans-Pacific uh, partnership. So we, there may be others that are coming in then India's internal growth in the next few years before they decide what partnership they are getting to. All that is there, but, but, but what, what, what we have to decide is how are we going to deal with it? Because if there, if, if for instance, I'm sorry, taking some time, but if the global warming goes up, agriculture gets affected. If agriculture is affected, then bulk of the India, Asian regions are gone. So we, we still rely a lot on uh, agriculture. Similarly, on the Indian Ocean, I think uh, places like Mumbai, Cochin, even Colombo, all will be underwater by 
end, end of the century. Bangalore won't, but I think the rest of us will be. So these are the main issues that we have to sort out. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I'll turn now uh, to Bo Inga Anderson, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Uz Auto Motors in Uzbekistan, a country that he describes to me as an old country, but a young country. Uh, your remarks, sir. Thank you, Rosalind. So I'm a little bit of old bird, so I represent automotive, but I also represent Uzbekistan government. So two quick points. It's clear that on electrical vehicles, the governments have decided that in 2040, we will all drive electrical vehicles. So how are we doing? It's coming very slowly. So for the first six months in 2021, roughly 7% of new car sales were electrical or plug-in hybrids. Secondly, the OEMs have invested 330 billion in uh, new vehicles for the last two years. Third, as consumers, we used to have 50 vehicles to pick from. Next year, we will have 553. The trick question, what are governments doing to motivate us? And what are governments doing to penalize us? Most governments have said 2040, it will be illegal to sell normal vehicles in their countries. Sweden, that is my home country, is maybe the most aggressive and say 2030. It will be illegal. So I would say declaration is clear, progress is slow, a lot of money is spent, and it will also have a huge impact on the workforce. My second topic is Uzbekistan. I've been here for months. It's, as Rosalind said, an old country with a lot of tradition. It's a young country, growing fast. The population will likely go to 37 million people in uh, the next three years. That means that energy consumption will grow 7% a year. What is government doing about it? They are investing in non-traditional energy sources. So the government has decided to increase the capacity of 12.9 12 gigawatts using hydropower, solar energy, wind and nuclear. So let's see what happens. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'd now like to turn to Chris Gopalakrishna, who of course is the Chief Executive Officer of the, um, and Chairman of Axelor Ventures in, in India, and very much of course known as one of the founders of Infosys. Thank you, Rosalind, and um, thank you, Horaces and Frank, uh, for giving me this opportunity to share my perspectives. Uh, the first point I want to make is um, uh, the current uh, COVID situation. And the reason for raising that is uh, how the world came together, how the world collaborated, how the world used science and technology to create a vaccine with unprecedented speed, got the regulatory approvals for emergency use authorization, vaccinated multi-billion number of people over a very short period of time. And of course, the crisis is still not behind us, but uh, I believe has given confidence to the world that uh, uh, using science and technology, uh, collaborating with each other, working with regulators, we can address a crisis in a very short period of time. In India, India is a still a, a emerging economy. Uh, per capita incomes are around $2,000 per head. In spite of that, we were able to vaccinate more than a billion people uh, in a very short period of time of less than one year. And these vaccines are manufactured in India. And now India is planning to export this for the rest of the world. So why am I saying this? You know, to me, the, the climate crisis, the sustainability issue is a very slow moving crisis, whereas the virus issue, COVID issue is a very fast moving issue. But we were able to come together. 
So can we now create a sense of urgency and a sense of, uh, you know, uh, collaborative work, leveraging science and technology, bringing in the best minds and the best resources around the world to work on this problem. Now, the costs are already there. Uh, we, we are seeing the costs already um, when we you know, look at the, um, the floods, the droughts, the untimely cyclones, prolonged heat waves, you know, um, the, the uh, changes in weather and, and, and forest fires that are seeing around the world again in Turkey, in the U.S. So we are seeing and uh, somehow or other we are not computing these costs, right? Uh, if we were computing this cost, there would have been a sense of urgency in addressing this issue. Uh, second, um, you know, you know, um, uh, Mr. Um, uh, you know, uh, Vikram Singh had mentioned this about um, you know the issue of climate change and how it affects uh, low-lying areas and you know several. Um, um, Coastal areas are going to be underwater. So, you know, what I want to say is the cost has go costs are going to be huge and a lot of people are going to be displaced. A lot of uh, people are going to lose their jobs. They're going to lose their livelihood, etc. And, 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 and unless we bring a sense of urgency, uh, we will not be able to solve this problem. So how can we bring a sense of urgency? I think governments have a role to play here because Government is the only, you know, uh, stakeholder in this who, through regulatory frameworks, can actually set a sense of urgency in this, in terms of, um, you know, um, creating the cost of uh, sustainability, making the cost of sustainability as a tax into uh, businesses, into um, the the goods we consume, the goods we import. Um, we need to do that. Of course, we need a global agreement in order to uh, make this indeed happen. See, businesses are making commitments. You know, India has made a commitment that by 2070, uh, we will be a net zero uh, uh, economy, a net zero country. Um, but we don't know whether it's too late or, um, you know, whether uh, we will delay this till the last minute. Similarly, businesses around the world have signed the uh, UN Global Compact uh, Agreements. Um, you know, many com 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 companies have committed to um, reducing their emissions by 95% or more. Uh, both talked about, uh, you know, uh, commitments to, um, you know, uh, roll out electric vehicles and things like that. But all of this, will this add uh, to uh, the necessary uh, targets? I don't believe so. Uh, and we will we will um, we will leave it to the last minute. So I want to bring a sense of urgency. I believe it can be done. Um, it, it can be done with uh, collaboration with science and technology, with the resources that we have, creating uh, viable businesses, leveraging sustainability as an opportunity. I believe it can be done, and we need to do this. Uh, I will uh, stop here at this point. Thank you. And just finally, we'll turn to Girish Ramachandran, who's the Asia Pacific President at Tata Consultancy Services in Singapore. Thank you. Um, so um, let me start off by saying that uh, if you look at the last decade or so, what we have realized is that there is technology in every business. Okay? But the last two years has demonstrated that every business has become a technology company. And that has been the shift that we have seen in organizations. Okay. <clears throat> and if you look at some of the, some of the changes that you know, the world is bringing, first, first and foremost, the youth are demanding bold and urgent action to address climate change. Okay. And we, we heard them at COP26. Consumers are the ones who are pushing all of us to become more and more environmentally and socially conscious. Okay. The third one is employees. Okay. Employees, if you look at it, the new generation of Gen Y and Gen Z are choosing jobs because they want to 
join companies which are more sustainable in nature. Okay. And finally, investors are also focusing on better performance and resilience of companies. Okay. So there is a push coming in from employees, from investors, from um, um, from uh, the youth as well as from consumers as a whole. Okay. We call this the Asian century. Okay. But if you look at where we stand on the sustainability agenda, um, if you look at, we need to have meet our SDG goals by 2030. As we speak, Asia is only likely to meet 10% of its SDG goals by 2030. So we are very much behind as far as sustainability in the sustainability bandwagon is concerned. Okay. So I strongly believe sustainability is not just about climate change. And it is about a whole lot of other things, which is which governments has to be worried about, which is job creation, aging, urbanization. The countries that we live in are all going through rapid urbanization, food security, education, healthcare. So there is a host of things that we need to look at when you look at the sustainability agenda. And I believe that technology has some solutions um, for some of these complex problems. I'll stop it there. And I'll wait to hear from others as well. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to actually circle back to something that uh, Mr. Mr. Wickramasinghe said early on. You mentioned some of the big trade deals, um, some of which have been actually agreed in Asia, some of which are still being agreed many, many years later and other countries wanting to join. Because it's one of those interesting questions of how do you bring sustainability into trade agreements? It's very, very difficult. Um, and as Mr. Ramachandran was just pointing out, sustainability goes a long way beyond just talking about the environment. But even getting services into trade deals is difficult, as we've seen, let alone things like labour rights and climate change. Uh, so, when, And especially when countries in Asia are at very different rates in terms of their economic development. Some countries are in certain levels and some countries are more, are more advanced in terms of their economic development and you're asking them to all get in a trade deal together. So how can we move forward in terms of putting sustainability properly into trade agreements where in a way that sustainability is actually going to, going to matter more than just some language at the very end of those kind of agreements? How important is that in terms of governments when it comes to tackling? It won't be easy. Firstly, we haven't got graphs which should really bring it in. So you've got to work out. It's a, it will be step by step. Uh, secondly, the issue is, are you really bringing the trade agreement to uphold sustainability or are you using it to block some trade coming into your country? Now, this is going to be a bigger issue. <clears throat> what is the actual purpose? Sustainability or is it a question of uh, another barrier or restriction on trade? So the, these are the issues that have to be answered. Uh, for instance, steel, I think, has now be, uh, become one of the controversies. In one way, you can protect the whole European steel industry if you want to sustainability. On the other hand, you can ensure that we hit the uh, Paris Climate Agreement targets. So uh, th There has to be far more discussions on it. And secondly, even if there is an agreement where this, these factors don't come in, the trade factors don't come into play, it's a question of how do you define it. And remember that for all item there is a custom classification categorization now how do you change it do you add something on it, it's a process that's going to take some time you won't get it overnight but if you work at it five ten years but the whole issue of whether sustainability is basically uh, used as a means to get at the net zero goals or whether you're using it to ensure that your domestic market is protected will still be open so those will have to uh, go through different uh, tribunals before it's finalized. It's a WT uh, job. It's going to be difficult. I don't think anyone can be saying this. Well, to that point, I wanted to turn to um, Boinga because, of course, you've got a lot of experience with companies navigating shifts, especially to electric cars. In fact, you've been involved with electric vehicles since 1993, which is probably well before anyone had, had generally heard even of electric vehicles but in terms of the role of government again like how do governments support green initiatives at companies including automakers is it carrot is it stick do you 
raise gas prices to sort of compel people to shift over? Is it the state has to come in and, and do that? Is it incentives to move to these kinds of products, be it cars or elsewhere, where you get subsidies um, or other financial incentives? Like, what is the role of the state? Well, thank you, Rosalind. Let me first start with some, some metrics. So in uh, 1960, 75 percent of all vehicles made in the world were made in the United States. Secondly, the late comer to the party is now the largest country of automobile production in China. And I applaud China for the government direction they have taken that they want the society to be driven based on electrical vehicles. So I think that's a very strategic view. Third, being an American citizen, I would say U.S. government is not that decisive, and that means that today 2% of U.S. car sales are electric. So government has a very big role to play. If I take another example, Norway, they made a commitment that they wanted the consumer to have freedom to buy a conventional vehicle or electrical vehicle at the same price. So for many years, you have got 20,000 euros in subsidy if you buy an electrical vehicle. So that's one way. Last, I think it's extremely important to look at what other benefits can I put in. It's possible to have free parking. It's possible that you drive your electrical vehicle in the bus lane. It's possible that you don't pay any toll roads. So I would say these three things, government has a role to play. In one area, you can say U.S. government is protecting its traditional industry. And in one way, you can say Chinese is leapfrogging because they have a standard and they are the largest producer of electrical vehicles today and will be the largest in the future. So some thoughts for thought. Thank you. Um, I wanted to turn actually to uh, <clears throat> To Girish, and this is sort of a follow-up to what uh, Mr. Wickremesinghe was saying about um, when it comes to governments and trade deals, and how again, in a way, governments can use sustainability as a protectionism measure potentially. And so you've got questions about how genuine governments governments might be, or how how altruistic maybe governments might be. But equally, you sit on the board of the GRI, so that's uh, reporting is a, an important issue for you and at the corporate level, how can we ensure that sustainability isn't just about box ticking? Um, because as you say, like um, young people uh, are looking for companies uh, that are sustainable in terms of their career paths, they're demanding that in their products, but how can we make sure that it's transparent at a corporate level so it's not just that companies can say, we're doing all these things, but in reality, how, uh, how deep um, and how true it actually Thank you, Rosalyn. So I, um, I genuinely feel in this um, digital era, transparency and uh, disclosure is extremely critical. Okay? And uh, in order for anybody to make informed decisions and evaluate how companies are and stakeholders are managing risks, we need to look at ESG performance. Okay? And ESG performance in the last uh, few years has become essential for and it's demanded, but like what I said, by investors, by customers, as well as employees. And it's considered critical for long-term success. Okay. So I really believe that uh, there is, a, there is uh, if you look at CEOs, CEOs have a specific job. Okay. CEOs need to understand that they have a role to play in building a sustainable, future-proof enterprise. And they have to ask the right questions of the to every business, pushing them to develop a sustainable strategy, okay, uh, along with the business with the compelling business strategy as well. Okay. Similarly, I strongly believe boards have to have boards have a larger view. They have a view of multiple companies, multiple countries, and well governed boards are focusing on how do you share responsibility of sustainability goals and KPIs across senior levels. Okay. That's the second part, which is extremely critical okay so i strongly believe that incorporating sustainability into the board structure as well as for the management board 
is very critical and as long as we take the long term view and and it's it's very very telling roslin if you look at number of companies who have survived in nasdaq over the last 100 years there are only a handful of companies most of the companies today if you look at the average life in nasdaq is only 15 years so it is very important to take a long term view of every enterprise and then ensure that they put the sustainability agenda and the society agenda at large thank you thank you um I'll swing around to um, Mr. Uh, Gopala Krishna because I was interested in what you were saying about the pandemic, and as we're all just watching frantically, the markets melting down. By the way, globally today uh, on the new new variant um, that seems to be proliferating very quickly around the world, and travel bans happening again. Uh, lots of countries banning flights from Southern Africa, for example, overnight. Um, and you talked about the way that the pandemic. on the one hand has sort of shown us that if we actually get our skates on together collectively we can do a lot i mean vaccines were developed very quickly uh they were rolled out in some parts of the world at least very quickly science and medicine have 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 advanced rapidly through that and we've kind of learned about how to handle the pandemic as we go along so on the one hand that's a big plus and that should be in theory transferable to to other big global challenges including climate change and sustainability but on the other hand is there any concern and I'm interested in the view of, of others on this also but for say to you that uh the the as the as the pandemic wheels into what it's sort of end of its second year at this point uh how much is that distracting governments um and economies because of course it's costing economically as well to deal with the pandemic companies are grappling with the the challenges of that with workers off and business changing like is that becoming uh is that getting in the way of of this progress and a governments and companies saying we can't deal with that right now that's we just need to get through the pandemic first so um as an aside i just want to mention that during the pandemic uh you know the the atmosphere cleared up several cities um became um you know better in terms of um, emissions etc and it it looks like um, you know nature um you know is um, is taking advantage of this uh, pandemic in its own way uh, to to do something to clean up the uh, clean up the world now having said that um, see i feel that um, excuses will always be there i feel that um you know one way to postpone one way to uh, make sure that an agreement is not reached is to say that this is very complicated the problem is very complicated the problem has to be looked at holistically the problem must include uh, not just uh, issue uh, issues around sustainability of uh, you know climate and and the world we live in but must include issues like uh, equality equity literacy you know we put all the problems into one box and and uh, then you have no solutions at all right because it becomes so complicated i i think we need to simply focus on the issue of uh, climate change and sustainability it has significant ramifications just like we focused on the covid uh, crisis laser focused on that the world had only one problem in fact we put the economy in the back burner we said um you know uh, people's lives first livelihood later right and we addressed the problem so you know we we need to learn from these things you know we can make problems so complex that it it's it's not solvable uh, you know and that's where um you know most people would try to push it or you know people with um, uh, vested interest will push it and we just need to say let's just focus on um, climate change we have a target of 2 uh, uh, degrees centigrade that we need to uh, get to uh, less than 2 degrees centigrade that we need to get to let's focus on what needs to be done let's just do it we the economy will recover the world has gone uh, through ups and downs you know people talk about 
money comes and money goes, right? So we can rebuild economies. We have seen world wars. Economies have been built, built, rebuilt. Germany was devastated. Japan was devastated during World War Two. The economies were rebuilt. They are now some of the largest economies in the world. It is painful, but you know these this crisis time, and and we need um, you know leadership from governments, leadership from business, leadership from uh, the non-governmental sector, um, the the society at large, and a single mind focus on one issue, one problem. Let's solve that. I'm interested in what uh, Mr. Wickremesinghe thinks about this, actually, because you were talking about again COP26 and that opportunity came and went, and some of the things that people had hoped would be tangibles from COP didn't eventuate, it, particularly around coal. Uh, do you see the opportunity for government leadership on this uh, that Mr. Gopalakrishna is is talking about, or do you see again that governments are going back into thinking about? their own country and what they need to do there and what's most important for them economically potentially how does i think the government has to provide leadership governments are the key players government provides leadership if governments do there will be others who come along which is not uh, effort which can be done by a government alone but there must be commitment the political parties must be committed to it leaders must be committed to it and down the line, so it's going to take a bit of time because you're in conflict. Okay, we we have this goal of net zero emissions. On the other hand, what do I do? My country, these these are the economic uh, earners for my country. So, uh, how do you work it out? So, uh, if you are being practical, then identify the issues and keep another five six years aside to discuss the issues and go ahead. That that I would say is the best best, best way forward. There's no 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 other way. You know, you, you, if you move a wand around, every government will not be doing it. But there will be enough who will provide leadership and in the key areas. So I, I would suggest that uh, that we go ahead. But then in this instance, it's both ecology as well as uh, economics. Ecology, economics, and I would also say well, there may be other epidemics coming around. This may be just the first. So let's, we, we've got to take it uh, as a whole. You know, we, we just can't unbundle them. From now on, with one one uh, at one, we are dealing to take all these questions, bundle them up, and get solutions to go along. But has it become harder for governments to act in the longer term? I mean, a lot of longer term political change can cause short term pain, right? Economic pain and disruption, and governments seem to be just through one election and they're campaigning the next one. Um, and of course, there's the immediate cycle of social media and 24-hour news, apologies for that, that um, that means that governments tend to be rolling from one moment to the other. And if you're trying to take long-term decisions in that, that may be unpopular in short term because there's structural change, but in the long term they benefit. How can, how can governments get to the point where they're looking beyond just the next week, just the next six months, just the next year? The first, the government and parliament must make it a national issue. So that everyone gets committed. They may have different solutions, but 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 you are committed to it. And this is not an issue which you can sort in five years or ten years. That should be known. So whatever government that comes in, they have to tackle the issue. And how they tackle the issue may be one reason either to vote for them or not vote for them at the uh, next uh, election. Secondly, as a politician, I would say first do what is possible. Politics is supposed to be the art of the possible. Then as you go, you can keep pushing the boundaries further and further. So each, each government has to see what is possible. How do you work around? Sometimes uh, neighboring governments might get together to come up with a solution. It's, it's, those are politics, but I, I think surely that those are ways you can find it because as the country, as, as the uh, people become aware, as a, there's a global awareness created, there'll be pressure on politicians, private sector, everyone. I wanted to actually ask Mr. Anderson about this because it's, there's, there's sort of these tensions and conflicts for governments, but there's also conflicts within companies about this, some of which you've talked about with me previously. So sort of the conflicts between investment and profitability and jobs and, frankly, unemployment um, in companies. And can you talk a bit about some of those challenges when it comes to the... 
Yeah, I think for all the people on the line, traditionally, the engine and gearbox production was a barrier for entry because to make an engine plant is typically a billion dollars. No one really wanted to sell engines to their competition. Today, there is no barrier of entry. Everyone can buy a battery. Everyone can buy an electrical motor. The second thing that I discussed with Rosalind is if you have big engine plants and big gearbox plants, they can employ 20,000 people. And tomorrow you don't need them. And in both Western Europe, in, in U.S., and in other countries that has a large automotive industry, CEOs are now under pressure to say, how do I go forward with electrical vehicles and what do I do with 30, 40, 50,000 people in high cost countries where people have high salaries? So I think that's the conflicting objectives. And again, here I, I agree government need to put the role and maybe support with restructuring funds how to overcome yesterday's reality into tomorrow's future. Thank you. And I wanted to ask Mr. Ramachandran um, about something because we've, we've sort of talked about global challenges here. We've talked a bit about what they mean specifically for Asia, but every country, every region is quite different uh, in terms of not just the global challenge, but the specifics of, of what they face. And I know that you looked at this when it comes to Asia in particular. What do you see as the unique challenges for Asia when it comes to sustainability in all the ways that you've talked about it earlier, not just being necessarily about the environment, but it being about things like food, sustainability, access to water and other and other key resources. And how does that play out when it comes to the business community in Asia? So we have a whole lot of problems, Rosaline, specifically in, uh, in Asia. I'll specifically mention a few things. Um, if you look at urbanization, okay, today, uh, we have almost 50% of, uh, of the population of Asia living in urban cities. And if, I, if we go with the trend, we will have 70% of the of Asian population moving to cities in the, in the next couple, in the next decade or so. Okay. If you look at aging today, aging is telling. If you look at Japan, if you look at um, uh, Singapore, if you look at Vietnam, okay, countries like that today, uh, are rapidly aging okay? and we are we are seeing a significant aging population and you need uh, you need uh, systems by the government to support the aging population okay um, if you look at uh, education okay um, as much as we say technology can help we have almost 150 million people 150 million kids um, today in ASEAN which were affected because they didn't have simple laptops or mobile phones okay? so these are bigger issues that probably uh, governments can handle. Okay. So I strongly believe there are three layers approach. One is that the government has a responsibility and I, I call it that the governments have to build what is called a digital spine. Okay. Every country has to build the digital spine so that businesses can r ride on the digital spine. Okay. India has done that uh, fairly well. Singapore is doing that on the health space. I think, you know, so a digital spine is extremely critical. Okay. What can uh, businesses do? Businesses need to look at what, how can we ride on the uh, digital spine so that we can reach out to as many people as possible. Okay. But the most important thing is also all of us. I call us digital citizens or DGSNs, Okay, All DGSNs, all of us have a responsibility to keep learning new things. And that is another, that's an art which we also need to keep on reskilling ourselves. So just like governments have a responsibility, businesses have a responsibility, so has all the citizens as well. So that's my view of what we need to do across Asia. Thank you. I would add that I learned something new this morning, which was how to tether my mobile phone <laughs> to get internet. So <laughs> I, I also uh, hope to continue learning. Thank you. Um, I wanted to turn to uh, Mr. Gopalakrishna um, in your work at the moment with Axelor these days. It's very much around tech startups in India and startups. And I wonder how an early stage company, a startup, I guess, can, sorry, start up um, by being sustainable. Can they, how can they tackle that from the outset when they're building the DNA of, of their company, especially when at that period in time, it can be very, uh, tricky from the investment perspective. You know, they need money focused very much to get their business off the ground. Can they do that and be sustainable from the outset? 
and 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 how can companies so um again you know you need an external force to um you know create uh, a um, set of rules or a template or uh, a level playing field it can't be just one company taking the lead and what i have seen is that um, the investors are all coming together um the investors so the investors who invest in these startups are the venture community but the venture community have limited partners who are sometimes uh, pension funds and large um, large funds family offices etc and they all have now or many of them have uh, come together to say that we need to track the environmental impact of a business environmental impact of a a startup and we need to report that so uh, now startups are starting startups are um, beginning to report um, you know how many jobs they are creating uh, what is the energy consumed by the startup uh, including you know the cloud storage and the computing resources that they are using and and how can they then um, reduce the use of such resources etc so Uh, there has to be an external uh, pressure brought in the investor community is one way to do this government regulations is another way to do it a, a company alone may or may not do it my theory is that 20% of the companies and 20% of the people will do something because they believe it's the right thing to do at the other extreme 10% of the companies will never do it 10% of the individuals will never do it they will want to break all the rules and take all advantages to themselves and the middle um, 70 80% are followers they will wait for um, you know they they will wait for rules and regulations or um, you know something to become the norm before they follow it you know they'll just wait to follow the others so you know if you want majority of the companies to do this it has to be through external pressure reporting requirements um you know by investment uh, committees and investment dollars etc and that's what i'm seeing in the startup ecosystem right now most venture funds are starting to uh, are beginning to re- require companies to report um, esg goals Okay, we have a few minutes left, but I want to actually ask Mr. Anderson and Mr. Ramachandran as a follow to that. Are you seeing that uh, with investors yourselves? Are you seeing those kinds of demands, interest language come into your conversations with shareholders, uh, with potential investors that they that they that they're saying they want to talk with you uh, about sustainability in a in a truly meaningful way, uh, not just in a box ticking way? But is that coming through in your conversation? I mean, if I start, it's very clear that Uzbekistan, we are on a growth path. Uh, when we talk to banks, uh, when we talk to investors, they are very, very interested in how are we reducing water consumption? How are we improving our landfill? And what are we doing to be sustainable? Uh, government on the other side is also giving us very clear instruction what they expect us to do. So, yes, I see it uh, very boldly. Mr. Ramachandran? Yeah, I see pressure not only from investors, as I said, but also from consumers, um, as well as from employees. But if I look at um, the problem on investor side is that today there is no convergence of the standards. Everybody uses multiple standards. Like, you know, I, I am on the GRI. Most people, most enterprises use the GRI standards, but there is no convergence of standards. So that is the first, first big problem which is there. Okay. The second one is there is a there is a need to improve the esg specifically practices across that and and uniform okay the third one um, there is not much data available on how do you capture carbon data okay that is a bigger problem that is there okay so real time carbon capture data is something that is not there and we need to get all of these things together so there is still some work to be done uh, before uh, before we get uh, a simplified approach towards this Thank you. And we are actually, we have just ticked over time. Um, I could keep going for ages because I had loads more questions I wanted to ask. 
but we are out of time. I would just say thank you to you all for making the time today to be part of this conversation. Um, I found it very interesting. I hope that our viewers and listeners did as well. Um, and I hope that uh, everything goes well with the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.